call this meeting to order at 702. We'll start with the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome, everybody, to the Village of Washingtonville Planning Board Work Session meeting. Today is Tuesday, August 10th. Just a reminder to the public there is no public comment during the work session. Public comment can be made during our regular meetings, which is the second meeting of the month. And at public hearings, if you're unable to attend, you can find my email address on the website, which is selenarofer.planningboard at gmail.com. We have one applicant before us, that is J and J Industrial LLC, 82224 Hallow Drive, an application for site plan, section, block, and lot 114-2-5.2 Industrial Zoning District with a proposed use construction of two pole barn buildings in the vicinity of 22 Hallett Drive. Mr. Hello. Caesar, you're here. How are you guys doing? My name is Nick Caesar. I'm working um, on behalf of the property owner, Mr. John Dillon. Um, he's a uh, member of the community. He owns a couple of businesses and some land. And uh, this land in particular he purchased um, a couple years back, uh, which has two uh, well-known um, businesses on it, Brookside Auto and Bradley's Auto Body, and I believe it also has a small hair salon. And um, basically, in the back portion of the lot, his intention is to um, develop a two commercial coal barns, which which, which, is, which I'm going to present to you here. So in front of you, I believe you have three documents, um, three sheet sets. The first one is basically a summary of the existing site, which is referenced directly from a survey that was recently completed in September of 2020. The other document is a proposed site plan. The other one basically is a simplified proposed site plan that just has most of the stuff pertinent to this meeting. Um, just a little bit about this particular project. This was initially submitted in December of 2020, um, and we were re referred to the planning board, and uh, Mr. John did his first review of this on 10 August 2020. Uh, we had made a bunch of changes um, to reflect it, mostly what was proposed was kept intact, it was some technical stuff. And then a second review was done on 9 January 21, and then we made some changes again. So now we're kind of at this point here. So um, I'm going to keep this kind of um, on a higher level and just stop and ask me if you have any questions. But um, this here is uh, the first sheet, um, sheet titled B. Um, this is just the existing site here. so. We have on the left hand side um, Bradley's Auto Body, and the right hand side is um, Brookside Auto, or the left side is Brookside Auto, the right side is Bradley's Auto Body, and then right now there's an existing parking lot in the front, and there's kind of a gravel parking lot in the rear. The gravel parking lot in the rear serves mainly um, in transient vehicles that those two auto body shops are working on. Um, they have ample amount of room as they exist, and all of that basically pertains to this outline here, which is a gravel parking lot. Um, the existing site is served with very minimal stormwater features. There's an um, existing stormwater culvert, um, which is shown on this map here. Um, that basically goes to a catch basin and into the moon and creek. Other than that, the rest of the um, site is, I guess you would say, undeveloped. The entire back portion of the site, which is in the vicinity of where we're proposing the project, is undeveloped and um, I would suggest it's a, like a low land marshy type of situation and uh, obviously the moving creek is behind it, we all know about that. So I'm um, going to move on to the second document here which is the proposed site. Um, as you can see here, this is the vicinity of the two proposed buildings. The two buildings are identical in nature. Um, they are commercial pole barns, so it's just uh, basically pole barn post structure with tin on the outside and then the inside will be finished afterwards. Um, I would liken the structure to look exactly like Santa Fitness. That's the same exact type of structure. He's used those structures in the past and he wants to um, continue to use them. They're, they go up quick, they're cheap, and they're generally high quality. Um, especially you can finish the inside. It's uh, a reasonable structure. Um, so this site plan would include um, some grading. Um, to basically bring that section of the property up 
above the floodplain, and um, and then basically a parking system there, which is shown on the map to include some handicap parking. Um, the parking that we have provided uh, is more than adequate than what is required. And um, I'll just stop here for any questions on this site plan. My question, uh, what made you decide that level for the gradient there, um, the height level? The New York State Building Code suggests that the uh, Finished floor height elevation needs to be two feet above the base flood elevation. So, one of the initial comments from the engineer was um, to get a, a new survey with um, flood elevation certificates of the two existing buildings. That suggested that the uh, base flood elevation was um, 305 feet. So, our finished elevation is going to be 307 and a half feet. It's going to be a little bit higher. So that's the logic behind that. Um, we have a topographic survey of the um, property, and you know, a section of that area in the back is at about 304, so we just have to come up about three feet. Um, so moving on to the um, second portion of the site plan, um, here we just show the bulk table requirements for the I districts and the parking calculations. So. Um, Basically, on this scenario, the, these buildings are going to be mostly industrial in nature. They're not going to be like consumer-focused buildings. So there's only a small area in the, each one of the buildings that is going to be available to patron use, which is just like the front office. Um, I believe what the original intention was was that um, they're going to be pseudo-industrial, like the, the three tenants that he had kind of been lining up were a lawn care facility, a pressure washing company, a towing company, those don't have very um, high levels of customer interaction. It's just like, hey, come pay your check or whatever, you know. So the rest of the facility is more storage and industrial type. So um, these these items for the new two proposed buildings, um, we're proposing um, 23 parking spots, which is um, the exact number that are, are required by the regulations because it's I think 70 one parking spot one parking spot per 75 square feet and then the other two parking the other two buildings on the site also have 14 parking spots which meets their requirements so the total parking spots on the site total would be 37 which is basically we're not changing the existing site we're just adding the parking for the, the back portion of the property um, based on what I've shown here, I think you have some comments in here that the bulk table requirements fall within the requisite nature of an I district. But I think you had a couple of tax changes, but it's not going to. Yeah, nothing significant. Okay. Yeah, it's um, everything's <clears throat> within the boundaries of the setbacks and stuff. It's kind of an awkward lot, but. So even with the changes, um, measuring from the perpendicular, that you don't anticipate any variances. It'd actually be longer. No. Longer. It's kind of weird with an irregular lot. Yeah. But so which one would you like? Um, I have a, yeah. uh, a wealth of measure. details because yeah. we went through two of these already if you want to see anything additional. Okay. Um, but the biggest, the most recent um, large submission was basically a stormwater um, pollution protection, prevention plan, which is something we just completed. So we have all of that. I don't know if you're interested in seeing that. It's pretty technical. Yeah, so that's, that's probably, the <laughs> so the applicant has oh, definitely, I, since the last time we've seen um, this applicant, there's been tremendous um, changes to the site plan, um, all moving towards reaching that preliminary state so that we can, you know, get to CCRA and get to the public hearing stage. Um, <clears throat> if the, I don't think this board has ever dealt with the sweat before, so if you want to. Yeah, uh, I mean, as Nick has said, they were here couple of times previously over the last year or so. Uh, tonight we wanted them to start. You haven't all seen it before, so giving you a brief introduction to the project. Normally what we do is focus on getting the layout correct, making sure it's a use your, your board is comfortable with, that you like the design of the site. Then they start working on the technical aspects. Uh, the stormwater you're more than welcome to 
read through and ask questions. In general, DPC has a manual telling you how you're supposed to design a project for stormwater. And the two main goals of it are to clean up the, the more frequent rainstorms, the showers that come, whatever roofing material or grease and oil that may be on a parking lot, to pull that out before dumping it off into a stream and to get a, at least a portion of that water back into the ground, trying to keep it in the aquifer where it was generated. And secondly is volume control or peak rate of runoff so that whatever amount of water leaves this property before they build, no more than that leaves after they build. The point in that is by keeping that rate of discharge down, we're not exacerbating anybody's flooding issues downstream. Yeah, um, so we did, I'll just talk briefly about two items. Uh, you mentioned just what the buildings would look like. Here's a, a general rendering from um, basically the top, probably almost, you know, Main Street looking down, plus or minus, this is kind of what the buildings would look like. Um, we have a lot of proposed trees in there, which is included in the stormwater management plan, but this is actually a rendering of the actual buildings. Um, the color is, you know, independent of this, but, and then, um, yeah, as you mentioned, there's some storm, some interesting stormwater features proposed. I'll just, there's basically some technical information around, regarding the proposed stormwater features, which is a proprietary system called Storm Tech. Basically, um, it collects the rainwater from the parking lot and puts it in an underground detention chamber under the parking lot and then slows, slowly releases it over the course of, you know, 24 to 48 hours. Um, that is in, in conjunction with, basically, because we're putting uh, impervious surfaces in the lot, we don't want to, you know, create that area of rainwater that just goes right to the river really quickly. It kind of gets slowed down and doesn't contribute to down, downstream flooding. Um, but there's also some sustainable features involved in this, which is uh, a bunch of trees being planted, um, basically converting a section of the previous parking lot, which was a gravel parking lot, back into a permeable state. Um, because gravel is, you know, generally assumed to be impermeable, we would basically um, deep rip and compact that area, decompact that area to allow it to be more permeable, plant grass, so that more water could be absorbed in those areas. And also including a, what's called a rain garden for the, the roof runoff. Basically, the water runs into a garden that's situated with uh, uh, plants that are typically um, inundated in water, and then you know those plants absorb it. And the water gets percolated into the ground and such. Um, the, the roof runoff from this particular project, I don't think, is going to be very contaminated because these are going to be metal roofs, so it's just like a quick runoff. Um, so that's some additional information. But the swale on the left side, so we have any improvements to that or any changes? On the left side? Um, which uh, you're talking about? It would be the west side. Yeah, this, there's this over here? Correct. Yeah, so as it exists, um, there is a stormwater catchment that's basically, I'll probably show you. So there's a stormwater catchment that comes this way, and then it goes like right here. And then this whole area is like a very unimproved, I guess you would say, I don't know what you would call that. Channel. Channel. It's not really a channel though, it's just like, it's maybe like a foot wide and three feet, a foot deep and three feet wide and water's just like, it's a seasonal kind of situation. Um, at this time, we didn't want to divert any water into that because it's, it's actually not on the property. It's actually like on the adjacent property. I don't know. It's kind of in between, but we didn't propose any um, specific <coughs> development to that just because we decided that's kind of a sensitive area because it's receiving water from offsite. So we kind of just diverted the water onto the site, from the site, onto the site, keep it on the site, and run it to the window from that. So to answer your question, no. Yeah. 
And the, the grass up front and on the side is going to very much stay the way it is? Yeah, so the whole, f you know, for all intents and purposes, the in everything that's existing on the site is not going to change. We're not going to change the parking, not going to change the two buildings. Um, there's actually a small catchment in the front of the property that's not going to change either. But that's all going to stay the same. All the, air the work is generally going to be in the back. This property is being proposed for development as a business development center development uh, because you have four separate buildings with multiple different uses. The business center development is kind of your catch-all in the code that allows for that mixture to happen. So that's the, the use that they're proposing. Uh, Nick has spelled out a few of the specific uses proposed as well as the existing. Because it's all one piece of property, it's all under your jurisdiction right now. They're not proposing any changes, improvements, modifications to the front two buildings, but it is in your jurisdiction to ask for if you would like to. Uh, you're not going to have to move a building. The buildings are there, but if there's landscaping that you would like to see, if there's lighting that you would like to see dealt with, that is open to discussion as part of this project. Is this where I do that part that we talked about? Yeah, whatever questions. Just to, and just quickly on the business center development, I just wanted to mention to the board that <clears throat> it's not listed in the permitted uses, but when you go to the special um, use exception section, it allows <clears throat> um, any uses that are permitted within it's like the O and L, B G, and one other um, zoning district and. Those are those, that reference is what allows it to come in as a business center development. Yeah, so basically the I district allows for special exemption uses, which any use permitted in the NB district, and the NB district allows for a business center development in section H. Does this issue with the number of buildings per lot this supremacy supersedes that, or that doesn't come into play here? So the Zoning Board of Appeals overturned that determination by the building inspector, meaning that it was determined that the, you could have more than one building on a lot. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, just as like background knowledge, that determination that you're talking about was for residential purposes and was not supposed to be applied to commercial. So there is a, and John correct me if I'm wrong, I think that there's several commercial lots in the village that have multiple buildings. So it would be in line with... I mean, his, his other property, which is right across the street, mm -hmm. has, is one property and has a gym and a social center and a lawn care place and a transmission shop in two separate buildings, but one building is a gym and the other one is this, like, industrial-type building. Right. So, so the, there was a question for a little while, but it's been resolved. Yes. So we, we don't have to worry about we that. We don't have to worry about that. Okay. Um, in that regard, you can, if you're concerned about any future subdivisions and possibly creating non-conforming lots in that way, you can request for the applicant to include a note that says no further subdivisions of the lot would be permitted if you're worried about that coming up later on. At this time, the client um, has not expressed that he wants to subdivide a lot that's not included in this action. I have a comment about the uh, driveway here going on to Locus. And I think we have the same comment about trucks possibly turning right onto that. Uh, I think a simple solution would just be a sign, no trucks right turning there, rather than trying to redesign all that. Because most trucks would probably be going left towards 94 anyway, towards the state route. Mm -hmm. So I have a turning radius. Well, especially if you said it's going to be a landscaping company, I assume a lot of trucks have trailers and stuff coming out of there. Yeah, so here's like a uh, turning radius diagram showing all applicable turning radiuses. From the first submission to this submission, I adjusted the angle of this um, driveway out significantly. It's a lot more. It's a lot more curved now. But for all intents and purposes, the junction between Locust Street and this driveway is perpendicular. It's not. It's not canted, even though it kind of looks like that. And the, the, the existing businesses are going to share that same entry onto Locust, correct? Well, the situation is that. The customer interfacing portion of those businesses is on the front. The back side is just like maintenance 
and individuals that are working yeah. on it. So yeah, the answer is yes. Can I do that? Do I... Oh yeah, right. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just want to. This is like a, an announcement. Uh, I'm familiar with John. John and I are acquainted. Uh, All right. I rented the space at uh, 24 Allen for a number of years, uh, so I'm very familiar with the property, Brookside. Rent. So I'm friends with pretty much everybody there. Uh, so I just wanted to make everyone aware of that. And if anybody has any objections, uh, I will, just, you know, recuse myself from participating in this. Um, haven't had any issues with John or anything like that. I know business and no current and, business dealings. And, and no current business dealings. But if there's any objections, I can recuse myself or I can continue to review the project. I mean, I don't know that's up to. <laughs> that, was, that was my advice. Mm -hmm. um, my advice was for just for it to be disclosed in, in public meeting. Um, if the public has any objection, now would be the time to <laughs> raise your hand. I guess from an ethical standpoint, if you think that it's going to, you know, impact the project in a, any, in a positive or a negative way, I guess more from a negative way. Than I mean, my question to you is your business dealings have ended, you have no current business dealings, and they ended on good terms? Yes, I guess it's kind of like in a small village like this. Everybody's Everybody Yeah, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a it's not a common yeah, thing to not, say because I mean, they're not currently engaged in exchanging <clears throat> any like monetary funds for anything. So yeah. um, it's it's in terms of an appearance of impropriety because you disclosed it, I'm comfortable with you moving forward. Um, so far as there's not um, an objection from another one of your board members or the applicant. Yeah. Everyone okay with that? Does anybody have an objection? Yeah. No. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sorry, I thought you were <laughs> That you're asking to ask him questions from the get-go. No, no, just <laughs> Sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't, just want to make sure I get that in at the right time. Yes. And, and the only thing I would comment is regarding the right turn there. Um, and having experience with how many trucks and deliveries and whatnot go into the back of Bradley's and, and uh, Brookside, uh, I don't think there's any issues with the trucks turning there. Yeah, I don't think, um, I don't think there's really an issue. If anything, like, if there is a big truck, just the driver would compensate in it's either going over a little bit or whatever. I mean, yeah, most, of the, most of the deliveries for Bradley and Chris were, were going in the back with straight job trucks. Yeah. They really didn't have any issues. Yeah, I, I, I've been back there a lot. I mean, Chris, my high school car actually got flooded in the back of Chris's shop oh, no. during Hurricane Irene. Oh, um, but, I mean, I haven't, I, I mean, this kind of attempts to display that I don't think there's an issue, but you kind of have to go drive there. John, did you have a comment on the turning there? Uh, on the on the passenger cars, you're showing a 16 foot turning radius. I gave examples of a few common cars. A smart car needs 14.3 foot. And then if you go up to a full size pickup and F-150, they need 27 feet. I think 16 feet is pretty tight. Uh, the F-150 is not going to be able to make it fully out of the space, let alone make a turn. So I think that's something you might want to tweak a little bit. All right. I mean, you may have more room there. It's just not dimension to show it. Yeah. And there's an excess of parking spaces, yes? Yeah, there is. And it's required? Um, for the uh, back lot? No. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. They're right at it? Okay. Because I was going to recommend the ones that, if there's an issue turning, um, and you can't are you talking about the ones like in 11 and 12 these spaces? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can either make them compact car only, but then it would affect. I, I would only recommend well, that. Well, I usually short a couple of feet. Okay. There's room to move the edge of pavement out a couple okay. of feet. Yeah, we can adjust those things. I don't. I don't think it's anything insurmountable. Yeah. You know, and as far as trucks, you know, if Bob, if you were working out there, you know, if you've seen it. I mean, you can definitely let your personal experience weigh in on your judgment. In this case, yeah. Um, you know, they're proposing a 20-foot box truck as their largest accommodated vehicle. I think it's going to be tight if you have to protect the buildings, but I've seen, you know, like they currently we put, they put trucks between these two buildings now. Yeah, so uh, one comment I've got the building protections. Each one of the parking spots has a proposed parking curb. Right. And then there's actually seven proposed bollards, uh, which is in like the areas of realistic um, collision. There's a bollard here, here, and there's a bunch of bollards here, and then one over here. 
So basically, any areas, you know, this is kind of an area where somebody would back in this way, there's bollards there. Same with this, this whole area of the building is protected with five different bollards, so if somebody's backing up, you know, that would limit their advance. Yeah, I did, I did see that you work that in, and you're protecting the buildings. If a couple of feet of asphalt here and there, yeah. it means that somebody saves their bumper. Uh-huh. And we have room on the, um, we have room on the asphalt. It's more of like an impervious surface. Yeah, I mean, you know how it works. Just like yes. Limiting impervious. I, I don't think it's anything you would have a problem working at. No, I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if the existing gravel parking area that Nick was discussing earlier, according to your code, all parking spaces need to be striped. Knowing what this use is, that he's storing cars as part of his auto body business on a gravel parking lot, it's a decision you'll need to make. I don't think that striping them is essential. It's going to be employees, not patrons using this parking area. But if you agree, you would have to make a decision to not have those spaces be striped. I guess one comment on that is, I, I guess I would almost suggest that they're not parking spaces, just because they're not part of the parking calculation. I mean, the parking spaces are in the front. These are more just like a utility area. How about I just jump in and I'll help the board just a little bit. Um, like I said, I spent a lot of years there. I know Bradley real well, Chris. Brad gets straight cars, bent cars, tow trucks, um, flatbeds. Some cars come in sideways. Uh, striping is just going to be a really bad idea for him. It's not going to work. Yeah. So that's why I'm just kind of saying. It's I mean, not, I don't know if it's a. I don't disagree stuff. with you. Yeah. But if he's going to park a car there for auto body work because it's wrecked, whatever, technically that's a parking spot, mm -hmm. and technically it's supposed to be striped. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is you would have to make a determination as a board that it's not required on this site for this, this use. Yeah. Well, I would be in favor of that person. It was just, again. Is anything else other than cars ever stored in that area? No, it's just like in a standard um, like vehicle maintenance facility, they just have the cars that they're working on in the rear, just kind of like, in, they're just in transient, you know, like you bring your car to get your uh, tires changed, but he's not ready yet, so you, you, know, you park around the front and you drive to the back. Yeah. I was going to say that's John's other automotive facility in the village. He was in for a site plan several years ago, and we did the same thing. He did strike all those out, but the board approved okay, go ahead and double park the cars. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not a normal parking lot. But they had to make a decision for the record because they weren't just going by code. I I consider it, it is more of a storage area. And, and even when they work on the cars, when customers pick them up, they don't go in the back and pick them up. Right. They brought them around to the front. If the, right, because if, if, if the board determines that, I mean, I guess you can, you can either agree or disagree. I would say it's a storage area. Um, we would have to Because it's not, it, meaning the storage area is being used by the employees there versus a parking lot, which you would assume is used by like patrons. Mm -hmm. Like it's mm -hmm. used by the employees, not even just parking their own vehicles, but used in the course of like the business. Mm -hmm. So I would almost classify that my, I would classify it as a storage area and then the requirement of striping wouldn't affect this particular use, especially if it's for the auto body shop. Yeah, I agree. Otherwise, if the code, code says stripe, you must strike parking spaces, I think it's, a lot I think of it, it is all, all it is is you have to acknowledge it. Yeah. Whether you call it a storage yeah. area or say it's a parking area that doesn't need striping, it's the same net effect. You just have to acknowledge it. Yeah. We'll, we'll call that's, it. I, I, that's all. I prefer the storage area. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense for this particular Gravel storage area for existing on a Yeah. That's easy enough. All right. Now, as 
part of their project, they're going to bring in a substantial amount of fill. The entire property is in the floodplain. So under FEMA guidance and village law, any fill brought into the floodplain, there needs to be mitigation for that. Uh, the floodplain basically acts like a sink full of water. If the sink is full to the top and you put dishes in, the water is going to overflow. And the fill does the same thing in the floodplain. There was an area on Cardinal Drive where... Attica, I mean. Yep. Previous projects have obtained approval to, on village-owned land, create additional excavation to mitigate for fill they were putting in on their projects. So, I did mention that to Nick previously, and he's worked out two alternates here, which would allow for that to happen. Uh, he would create his excavated area, mitigating his fill on site. This is village-owned land, so this permission would have to be given by the village board, not by this board. So, part of what he's going to need initially from you is a referral to the village board for that determination to be made. Uh, it has been done in the past. There is one site currently doing that excavation work out there as we speak. Yeah, it's actually like right here. Right. Um, I think it's smaller than what we're proposing. Initially, I proposed basically half of this area and then the second half of it to be excavated from out here. But in the course of the planning process, we did a deep pit test out here, and basically the groundwater level is high. So you're not really going to get much out of that area. It's just going to make it um, you know, very swampy. You're probably just going to hit water. So I basically removed that concept and I'm, this kind of graphic I'm just basically showing the feasibility of removing the amount of fill that would be required for this project would basically at a two foot depth basically be 200 by 500 feet um, that is basically what they're doing right here I think this is for the I, don't, I could talk about maybe the chemical plant. Or oral. Yeah. yeah so they're they're basically just taking two foot off the top in a square and they put silk fence around it just, I can't speak much to that. But. Nick is moving pretty far along on his plans. I'd like to see him get the okay from the village board before he goes too far in a direction. Mm -hmm. My recommendation to the board would be to make a motion to refer um, Jane, Jane J. to the village board of trustees for a determination on whether or not the proposed fill sites or excavation sites for floodplain mitigation would um, be acceptable. Does the board have any comments for me? Yeah. No, I don't. Does somebody like to make a motion for Jane Day Industrial to be referred to the board for approval on fill excavation? 